Hey everyone, it's Gavin and Ryan from Havertech Designs. And uh, this is a special day because this is 52 weeks of the sound project, a full year of the sound project. And we're just so happy that you're a part of it. And uh, we're really excited as well of all the new episodes that we have coming out this year. So thanks so much and enjoy the episode. So we have a very special guest today on the Where? podcast. Where? Special. I don't know. I'm special. waiting for him. Special. No, just... Yeah, you're waiting. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for him too. <laughs> we have Warren Hewitt from Produce Like a Pro. Uh, well, very thank kind. you so much, Warren, for for taking time out of your busy NAM schedule. We're at NAM, and uh, you are always. Every time I see you at NAM, someone is pulling you aside. And so the fact that you took time to come here and do this, it's very appreciated. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Gavin. As I'm sure, if if you ever watched any of our videos has been an instrumental in helping us a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fun. I it's, uh, we've known each other for maybe 3 years or something like that. Yeah, it 3 or 4 been, years something like that. Yeah, but uh um it's always fun to to get to catch up with you and um I'm sure a lot of our viewers already know who you are, but uh maybe tell a little bit about your background and what uh, you could be as long or as short as you want it to be, but some of your your history. Oh, don't don't give me a no time limit. <laughs> Everybody, I'm everybody's going to be tuning over out. Here. And then, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I started off, uh, I mean, clearly I, I am, I'm British English, um, grew up in a little village. Um, it was lovely. And, uh, my parent, my father, uh, my dearly departed father, he was uh, a painter and a sculptor. Mm -hmm. And I always say it was like having a bass player for a father. <laughs> it was basically feast or famine, you know? Yeah, sure. But we, we didn't really, uh, but as a child, didn't really, we didn't really know that we were poor as such but what was great about it was having creatives for parents you know mm -hmm. yeah it's just a great atmosphere to grow up in my father um being an artist loved the best of any kind of arts yeah. so you know so i got to go to covent garden and see opera as a child i grew up with classical music and jazz mm -hmm. um, that was all i heard for years so i'd go to school and i'd be like what is this other pop rock and rolls <laughs> i didn't really relate to it but my father bought uh, a night of the opera for me when i was super little like younger than our daughter mm -hmm. and um gave it to me for christmas and said uh, this is worthy okay like you're allowed to listen to this <laughs> nice. because you know bohemian rhapsody at that point was an absolutely massive hit mm -hmm. and it had so much classical um stuff to it and and I just fell in love and that was it. And and what I loved about that record in particular, if you know it well, it's all over the place, you know, genre wise in mm -hmm. the best possible way. Right. Like revolver is all over the place genre yes. wise. And it, it's like kind of a gateway drug because you can go heavy rock quite easily because there's some heavy moments like prophet song is like super heavy, you know, um, or you can go completely proggy because also proggy uh, prophet song, but also a bit rhapsody, mm -hmm. or you can just kind of get into the silly poppiness of it at times, you, yeah. know, you know, keep good company, you know, like little, it, it, oh. and of course it's a production masterpiece. Right. So it wasn't like some silly little seventies pop s song album. It was, <laughs> You know, it fit really well into into the you know, Tchaikovsky and the uh, Katachuri and, and Beethoven and Brahms and, right. and, and Mozart that my dad was playing and Handel every day, um, and of the great jazz that I was listening mm -hmm. to. You know, my I, I was blessed because the first time I heard a guitar player, it was Django Reinhardt, oh, nice. and then it was Joe Pass with Ella Fitzgerald, and then mm -hmm. it was Wes Montgomery and Charlie Christian and yeah. Barney Kessel, and so you know, so I was hearing like the greatest guitar players ever, and John Williams and and, and Segovia and. So that, that was my guitar playing idea. And then suddenly I'm being handed Brian May at his peak of genius. <laughs> right. You know, so. That's awesome. I had did a panel just before this. We actually just came from a panel in in, in, uh, in the convention center. And I, I, I like to say this. I was lucky because I fell in love with music a little too young. And, and that's actually a benefit because I think yeah. for a lot of people that, you know, maybe 13, 14, 15, 16, starting to get into it, that's great. But that's also when you're discovering lots of other stuff. But at seven, yeah, it like, you know, it really is ingrained in me. And I also think that when you're that young, you, uh, it's almost like you don't have any inhibitions about stuff. Sure. It's like you, you don't know what can't yeah. be done. You don't, you don't care about cool. You don't feel like you have yeah. any limitations either. Yeah, there's so. no like, oh, I can't be into this band. I don't like his haircut or yeah. something. You know? Yeah. I was like somebody, so people uh, often say, you know, Warren, you dye your hair. I'm like, I've been dyeing my hair since I can remember. <laughs> I had, uh, I, I've either gone jet black. There was a period 
in my teens when I had a pink mohawk. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. You I got had any pink pictures mohawk. of that that we could edit in? To the- I've got to find one because <laughs> the, the, the reality is you, you go back over 20 years ago. I'm sure you, you understand this. Mm-hmm. Nobody was walking around taking cell phone photos. No. You could you could literally have a haircut <laughs> for three months that looked a certain way and right. you nobody would no have taken would your know. photo. Right. Nobody took photos in those days. That's true. Um, but, yeah, pink mohawk, blonde spiky hair, jet black. I mean, this is the music industry. It's right. like I seem to remember, you know, strange but yeah my my point is is like you know it was an outlet for me um it was the it 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 was the only thing that made sense when i was a child you know music was 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 guitar your first instrument it was it was i i do say this quite often if you're early on in your production career or musical career Keyboards is a good way to start. I wish I'd done that. I yeah. play guitar, and yeah. my, my both my kids play piano, and I'm like, that's just such an easier way to learn like music theory and everything. It's easy. Everything's there. There's mm-hmm. only one middle C. It's in the middle. Yeah. Uh, on a guitar, as you know, it's in mm-hmm. one, two, three, f- four easy to reach places. <laughs> sure. Five if you want to go the low E, really high. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, typically speaking, yeah, there's four ways to... So if you're running around the neck trying to read something, yeah. and then suddenly it says, you know... Um, you know, E flat. <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay, well, that's either here or here. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I wish I would have learned on that, but I took guitar lessons early on and then they were teaching me things I didn't really want to know. And so I just taught myself how to play, uh, which is probably why I'm not as good as I could be because I taught myself. But as, I, I uh, taught, I didn't, I didn't really have any lessons except for this guy called Ollie Alcock in, when I used to live in the north of England. Mm-hmm. And he, it was less about him showing me things to do. Mm hmm. Because this, again, is a pre-internet kind of world. Yeah. It was more about him focusing me on what was important, what I should learn. Sure. For him, the takeaway, I remember, was you want to be a feel player. You know, you want to play with feel, then you have to listen to Jeff Beck. Yeah. And he made me listen to Paul Kossoff as well. And was like, you just listen to like his solo on Fire and Water and learn that and realize it's not about being flashy. But then... You want to think outside the box, think Robert Fripp, mm-hmm. you know, think of coming in from a completely different direction. He's like, you want to learn how to 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 play really good right-hand technique, go listen to Aldo Miola, Land of the Midnight Sun. Yep. You want to get Legato, go listen to Alan Holdsworth. Yes. You want to learn good rhythm playing, you want to learn funk, you need to listen to the, the master of funk, Nile Rogers. You know, it was like, that was like a huge education. Sure. He was showing me things, but more importantly, he was pointing me in the right directions. Yeah. Yeah, and allowing you to pick and choose what you yeah. you wanted to take from it. So. Yeah, to be honest, I just took everything you said as <laughs> as, as as the Bible. I was yeah. like, and I, and to be honest, he never led me wrong. I yeah. mean, there was no better legato player than than Alan Holdsworth. Right. There's no better right hand picking player than Al Di Miola. Yeah, you know? that's, yeah. I wish I had more direction like that when I was younger. Playing. Yeah, I was 16. It was yeah. it was like. That's great. Amazing. Well, how how did you go from uh, playing guitar to into production? Like, what was that transition like? Well, it's because it's going back, it's going back to the reason why I tell that story. It's going back to being too young. Mm-hmm. Because the thing about when you fall in it, fall in love with it when you're super young, it's not about partying. It's not about girls. It's yeah. not about like any of that. It's just about the love of music. Yeah. And I found that because I'd grown up on classical and jazz, that the initial albums at really young that I gravitated towards were these production masterpieces. Mm-hmm. So I had Out of the Blue, Earlo. I had um, I had uh, Super Tramp Breakfast in America. These were all around that period, and they're all albums that were just masterpieces. Mm-hmm. And of course, I was listening to a lot of jazz through my father, a lot of classical. Um, he had bought when I was like, maybe even he bought tubular bells mm-hmm. before, even before that. So there was all this stuff that was really very much production masterpieces. Um, and so I fell in love with all of that side of the music. I wanted it to be as full and as incredible sounding as this music. But then, of course, you know, I got to like 13, 14, 15, and I rebelled, and, mm-hmm. you know, it was like suddenly it was punk rock and yes. all that stuff <laughs> that we all do. But I feel like that's what's great because you, all of that to me is the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's like I often talk about, excuse me, about uh, when we do those songs that change music or albums or artists that change music – We'll move around all over the place. And to me, some people are like, oh, well, you know, if you stayed more with like a certain genre, you'd probably get a, a bigger audience if you stay in this place. But I was like, it, but it's all the same to me. I did. We did a video on Dwayne Norman, mm-hmm. And then next week we did Fela Kuti. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> and like everybody's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. You've got like a boomer audience listening to your Dwayne Orman and then you're going to go into like Fela Kuti, who, who knows? I was yeah. like, but to me, it's all the same thing. I mean, sure. Afro beats the biggest kind of pop music at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, it came from Fela, you you're know, right. and, yeah. you know, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's all the same thing. Yeah. You know? yeah uh, the just... Dam's first record still one of my favorite records. Right up against A Night of the Opera, which is still probably my favorite record. Yeah. Right up against Revolver, right up against Pet Sounds, mm -hmm. right up against What's Going On, Marvin Gaye, or uh, Live at the Village Vanguard, One and Two, John Coltrane, or Kind of Blue, Miles Davis. To me, mm -hmm. they're all the same thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just they were like, the same edge, the yeah. same attitude, the same something to say. Yeah, there's certain albums that you listen to and they just have it. Like yeah, it's, it's whatever that is, um, yeah. and for some people it'll resonate more with uh, others. But uh, you can play a, a, an album like Night of the Opera for someone who only likes hip hop, and they'll still find yeah. interest in it. You know, and it's it's a. Uh, it's, it's funny because Kind of Blue is the most beautiful. Yeah. Like put it on in the background, have dinner with your family. Mm -hmm. Amazing record. Yep. It's also as punk rock as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally yeah. punk rock. It is a bunch of African American black guys getting in a room and just laying it down yeah like yeah. you listen to it and you go these guys were just like middle fingering everybody <laughs> yeah but you hear it it's beautiful but it's not it's still just like mm -hmm. yeah yeah we are showing you the way it's supposed to be done and here we are 60 70 years later talking about 70 years later being one of the greatest albums ever mm -hmm. made yeah by a bunch of guys that were probably making you know 40 dollars a week or something that's wild so it's as punk rock as it gets yeah, yeah. And i think so to me that connects with the dam just as much as it connects with uh tchaikovsky or whatever you know for sure man so you were introduced to it really young and then um what was the first like something that you recorded like it's funny because we just did a panel and um one of the people and i wish i'd got to to talk about it there but now i can and they were saying it was this argentinian songwriter uh, and and uh they were saying that they had taken cassette players and done overdubs that way and it's exactly what i did yeah. i listened to i started playing guitar very late i started about 15 16 years old which is all my friends have been playing for a couple of years by that point so i had, to, I had a crash course in it mm -hmm. and i remember um my dad had a Philips compact cassette players. Remember the ones with the the one control that would be like play, fast forward, stop, yes. all one thing. You just kind of go yep. play, fast forward, <laughs> rewind, stop. <laughs> and I would play guitar through my dad's hi-fi. So blow up the speakers, put it into record, plug into it, and record onto that cassette player. Wow. And that was how I did it. So you, you went play and record, plug your guitar into the mic input. Yep. Yeah, it, uh, blew up speakers all over the place. <laughs> but then what I did is I got an amp, mm -hmm. the worst amp. It was called an FAL, foul, yeah. which in English, foul means terrible. It's Something right. is foul. Um, <laughs> I think it was called Futuristic AIDS Limited. Nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a dreadful amp. It was a bass amp. I had a, a pedal called a Colesbra Suz pedal, which now, of course, is really valuable because it's so weird and wonderful. But at the mm -hmm. time was like for the kids that couldn't afford a boss pedal, you sure. know, you wanted a DS one, but you couldn't afford it. So you got the Colesboro <laughs> Suz pedal. So I, so I had my amp and what I would do is I would, I would play, play a guitar part and I wanted to be Brian May and I wasn't anywhere close to it, obviously. So I'd play a rhythm and then I would take, I'd record that on the, on the little cassette player. Then I take that and play it through the hi-fi while simultaneously recording on the other cassette player. Mm -hmm. So I'd do an, that was how I'd do my overdub. Okay, yeah. So I'd be playing through there to hear like, and I'd go, and I'd like play a guitar part over the top of it. And then I'd figure out a harmony. But of course, that guitar part and that was being bounced, was being simultaneously recorded into that. So I take now take that tape out, mm -hmm. put that in the hi-fi, play the rhythm part, the first lead part, and then have you know the second yeah. tape in there, and then do the harmony part. Man, to it. and of course you know en ended up with like you know these harmony parts trying to be Brian May, mm -hmm. really badly done. At that point, when I first started, I didn't understand the difference between a third or a fourth or a fifth. I was just playing by yeah. ear, yeah. trying to make a harmony that worked. Sometimes it was really good. Sometimes it was like, what are you thinking? <laughs> um, and of course, it always ended up sounding like <laughs> right. But but it was fun. But it was fun, and it was multi-track recording, right? 
Right, and just doing it. It's always great to obviously just use the tools that you have. And I and love I mean, limitations. Yeah, and I think that, uh, yeah, it, limitations are great because yeah. I think sometimes right now people get paralysis from all the options that you can, you know, you have every plugin in the world and it almost paralyzes people from being able to just get something done. Yeah, we were talking this song because it was a songwriting panel and I use that quote that probably everybody watching has heard a thousand times, if not from me, from a thousand other people. But Tom Petty said, you know, if I had been a really good guitar player, I wouldn't have been a very good songwriter. Yeah. And I think that that's where limitations really are a blessing. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you can focus in on something and get good at it mm -hmm. within whatever kind of scope you have, that's far better than, you know, trying to, you know, be great at 10,000 things. Now, yeah. don't get me wrong. As you get older and wiser and work more, that all of that, the, it, those possibilities are there. Yeah. But you know, starting off, starting off, you know, focusing on one thing and growing as you as you should is just yeah. really healthy. But at the end of the day, um, I'm not a very good living example of that because I've always just kind of like ran into a wall and <laughs> fallen over and done it again and again. Oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. So I think the reason why I bring that up is because I think about a lot a lot of us. Um, we don't cut ourselves some slack. We don't give ourselves the opportunity to fail and make mistakes. Yes. And I think yes. that that's super, super important. You know? Yeah. It's that whole perfection is the enemy of the good quote. It's, yeah, it's like that. It, you, you almost don't even put out songs where you're like, well, it's just not perfect yet. Or I'm going to wait to get this piece of gear because then it'll be the thing that makes this right. song better. It's just, you know, it's like complete things, get it out there what? and move it, on to the next thing. It's like... It's like on the, in the YouTube world, for instance, I'm, I'm sure people that are watching this will know this. Mm -hmm. There's uh, there's an incredible guy, the, uh, Ola, the big Swedish kind of, you know, uh, Swedish uh, Viking looking god guy. Mm -hmm. And he's a phenomenal guitar player. And he, I, I met him the first time a few years ago. And he said to me, he goes, I get kids telling me I'm not a very good guitar player. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I've heard you play. You're a phenomenal yeah. guitar player. He's like, yeah, but he goes, I just stick a mic in front of the amp, get a sound up, and then yeah. I try out a guitar and I play a couple of riffs and then I edit the video together and give an honest thing on it. Mm -hmm. And he goes, the problem is, is they're used to the other 999, you know, mm -hmm. of the thousand people who do exactly that, but edit their DI perfectly in time, yes. tune all the notes that are absolutely perfect, mm -hmm. and then mime to it. And that is 99.9% .9 of the videos that you see online. Sure. But then you get somebody who's just really good, yeah. you know, giving you the performance, mm -hmm. and people think it's not very good. So what happens is you've got, the reason why I'm bringing this up is you've got kids watching this going, oh my God, I'm not as good as this, you know, name drop, famous YouTube guitarist. Sure. And I don't realize that that is them miming to a perfectly edited performance. Right, right. And 99.9% .9 of it is that. So, yeah. so the reason why I say cut yourself some slack, like remember you on, you know, Miles Davis in a room is going to make your hair stand on an end for all of the reasons of the, of the you know, I, I got to see him live just before he died. And oh, wow. God, it brought me to tears how good he was. Um, but the point is, is like the frailty, those, those notes where it's, that, yep. that things things that aren't quite perfect. That's what makes it. Makes it, brings you to tears. And it, his artistry was just unbelievable. But if it had been like this perfectly tuned and time thing, maybe people would think, oh, he's a virtuoso. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't have the lasting impact of, of, right. of what we have. So, so cut yourself some slack, you know. Don't worry if you're not perfectly yeah. perfect because nobody is unless they're heavily edited and <laughs> yes. tuned and well i think that's probably why you've been so successful as a producer like that outlook is because you give you probably give your artists a lot of grace too and and allow them to experiment and i think so but you don't learn anything uh, otherwise and i think that uh, one of the things um, and, and i've been through this when i when i give this advice it's because i did all the things wrong as well <laughs> sure like the wrong and one of the things that i got wrong when i first started was when i was on tape there was limitations so when i was producing people on tape you just had to keep doing it until it was tight you know mm -hmm. oh you need to punch here fix this or say to the bass player and drummer you know that 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 isn't grooving in that second verse you know work on it and they'd come in and they'd listen to the parts and they'd realize that, you know, the bass player needed to lay back or the drummer needs to do this, whatever it was. And there was that sort of interaction of two musicians together. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was when we got our first 
your hands on a DAW, you could edit things. Mm -hmm. You just thought you were cutting down on time by editing it. <laughs> and that's fine if you work within the parameters of humanity. Okay. But the thing that I used to, that used to happen to me all the time was I would edit things like within an inch of their life that it was so perfect that they ended up sounding small. Yeah. Not even so much they lost their groove and feel. That was a given. That would always remove that. Yeah. But they would also sound small. I think Andy Wallace, who was one of the greatest mixers ever, said it, I don't know, 25 years ago? It was like late 90s he said it. He said the records he was getting, that was starting to get the Pro Tools records, it's not Pro Tools' fault, there's all kinds of DAWs, but the Pro Tools records he was getting at the, the time mm -hmm. was sounding smaller than yeah. the tape records he was getting. Wow, well, yeah. Because everything was so perfect. The one and, the one instead of going crang was crank. Yeah. Yeah. Crank. Everybody was like, da 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 You know, that kind of... Because when I was a kid, it was like, here was the kick drum. Mm -hmm. The bass had to be slightly later. So it was like attack of the kick and the oom um of the bass. Right. <coughs> the guitar could be slightly ahead and it would add to the excitement. Crang, you know? Yep. So you could be you could be urgent sounding on the guitar, laid back on the bass, and the kick and the kick drum was sitting right between those two. Yeah. And that felt like a really big fat one. That kind of crang, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly he was getting records with people with the same disease I had at the time, making everything perfect. So mm -hmm. all of his ones, his percussive huge things, were so perfect that they were getting tinier and tinier yeah, and tinier. I can see that. Um, so I want to talk, too, a little bit about, uh, since this is a podcast about studio design and acoustics yeah, and things like that, I, I think uh, I'd be curious to know like what your experience is working in different studios and how the acoustics of those spaces has impacted what you have to do as a producer. Well, I, I can tell you some I tell you some horror stories. I worked in a studio. There's been a few. Um, the horror stories wise, I remember. God, which studio we were in? We were in Seattle. I'm blanking on name. It's quite a famous studio, and the whole um, the whole one side of a wall was just like glass, mm -hmm. and it was so so bright. And they didn't. Strangely enough, even though it was all glass, they didn't seem to be aware. There wasn't like many <laughs> packing blanket situations. There wasn't much gobbles. Uh, you, you, um, you know, but we did whatever we could to dampen it down. Sure. But we ended up just going, oh, let's use, you know, ribbon mics as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Things that don't have a response above 13K that kind of roll off quite dramatically. So we did um, we did everything we possibly could. And that was, you know, that's a less than perfect situation when you've got really aggressive drummer who's smashing the schnizzle out of the cymbals yeah. and the room's just yeah. so unbelievably yeah. bright. And then I've been in control rooms where... It doesn't exist anymore. It got sold, but um, there was a studio um, on, on the Kawanga Pass, which had an amazing live room and a great control room. But they had a mix room, and this mix room, nothing translated. Oh no! And they spent a fortune with different designers well before oh, your time. It's like twenty years ago, mm -hmm. and and I I had to mix a, a live album in there, mm -hmm. and it was just terrifying. I've never been in a room that that made <laughs> so little sense, and so I would go into the into the parking lot. And play, um, play what I had just done. You know, mm -hmm. bounce it to a CD or a cassette, whatever it was, CD, and and sit there and go. What did I just waste my time? What did on? I just waste? Yeah, <laughs> I just spent ages trying to get the low end right. Could never get the low end right in right. that room. And the problem was, is it was also at a point like twenty, maybe twenty five years ago, where I was still struggling with getting it consistent. Yes, and so I needed to trust the room. Now, mm -hmm. quite frankly. You could give me. You, we could just set up a, a system here with right. a pair of speakers, and I'll, I'll, yeah, it, it will sound pretty darn good. Yes, because I'll know what kind of parameters. Yeah, I, I, if I'm boosting sixty hertz, nine dB, I know something's wrong. Something's wrong. Right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so it, it's like you can pretty much. It's like when when Chris, Chris or Algy did a mix once, and he said he could do it on meters without mm -hmm. listening. Oh yeah, and it's possible because yeah. he knows what to boost and cut to what nth degree. For sure. Um, so it's quite possible. He'll get closer on a mix, yeah. you know, just by watching the meters mm -hmm. than most people in their first, like, five years of mixing, you okay. know, just because he's got all that acquired knowledge. Yeah. Um, but that, for me, was a difficult experience because it was, like, 25 years ago. And, yeah, I could do some really good mixes. I had done lots of – but I, ha I had to be in rooms that I could trust. Yeah, yeah. Now – yeah, I think a lot of that is experience and talent, of course. But um, uh, if you don't have to overcome that and have a good room, that's, yeah. a, that's a better thing, especially if you're starting it, it, out. It is a better thing, definitely. Um, I think it's why a lot of people work on headphones at first. Mm -hmm. And frankly, you know, 
you're better off with a pair of headphones that you can trust than than being in a room which has got completely uncontrollable issues that you sure. won't do anything. So sure. that is one solution. But then you do have to have headphones you can trust. And 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 the difficulty is like you know everybody you know Andrew Sheps mix, mixes on a pair of Sony seventy five oh sixes which are. I don't know. I see Guitar Center and Sweetwater sometimes selling for seventy nine dollars. Right, right. So yeah, go and buy a pair of Sweetwater headphones. But the reality is, is they have no low end. Right. So you would have to know how to mix mm -hmm. to make them sound good. Right. So really, the best thing is to be in an environment. You've either got to buy yourself a pair of like, you know, Odysseys I really like, which are fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars, mm -hmm. or you've just got to do something about your room yeah. and make sure that your room sounds honest enough so you yeah. can actually trust what you're doing. I personally don't mind mixing on headphones, but it is exhausting. Sure. After a while, it's quite fatiguing. Yeah. I I can do more damage to my hearing with headphones on than I will in a room. Yeah. Um, you know, and also sometimes I lose a bit of perspective, you know. That's why I suppose some of the things like Stevens VSX helps because it can bring a bit of ambience in there. Mm -hmm. But there's something satisfying about sitting there between a pair of speakers, you know, and being yeah. able to kind of move around, you know, <laughs> yeah. kind of experience it. A lot of mixers that I trust tell me they get up, walk out of the room, go and listen down the corridor oh, yeah. and see how it translates. Sure, and, sure. and that is all part of their experience. It's like their car test because mm -hmm. they're maybe used to going into the kitchen and listening to their mix from the other room Sure, and they know how it should sound. Yeah. And if they're in there and it's like, it's not booming, then there's not a lot, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever it might be. Something's different. Yeah, I think, and well, speaking of uh, making a room better, we worked on that room at y at your place. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, our old house, yeah, our old, old studio. Yeah, and that was a that was a fun uh, kind of project to work on, and it was, you know, geared more towards hey, let's try to use off the shelf products and make yep. this room as as good as yep. we can with that. And I, I mean, it turned out really great. We did the testing in there, and it and, did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Are you using that room a lot? We, we 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 moved since then. Oh yeah, that's right. So I was wondering that you sold that house there. Or? Yeah, we have okay. we have another studio now, Got it. Uh, which was already built. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Am, I, am I allowed to say who did that one? It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, obviously, it, we bought an existing studio. It was it's a really great sound room. It was done by Jay Kaufman. Oh okay, nice. Yeah. So Very both cool. the control rooms sound amazing. In fact, actually, Stephen Slate sub lens sub uh, rents from us oh, because cool. the room's so flat. Yeah. He goes in there to do his VSX headphones. Oh man, that's he, awesome. So he models the speakers in the room because the room is so true. Is that still in the LA area? It's still in the nice. LA area. Nice. So there is a, there, you know, there's a reality, you know, get the room sounding amazing and yep. you can do whatever you like in it, including modeling headphones. That's awesome. So I, I do want to t touch on too, like uh, what made you start Produce Like a Pro? Like what was that, that deciding factor? Well, I think the reality is, is like, it was a logical step. Mm -hmm. My wife had told me that, you know, everybody contacts you all the time to ask dumb questions. <laughs> and I've, I, I, you know, it's like you were saying, just to it's like tie us all together, when, when you were saying, oh, you know, thanks for coming in and you get stopped all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's actually one of the most rewarding things. It is. Yeah. You know, because then you feel like you're actually of use mm -hmm. because part of the problem with, you know, you know living, living in this world and doing music is like sometimes you just feel like, Okay. Yeah. I get to do, you know, a hobby for a living. Right. You know, and it's fa fantastic. So if you can actually help people, yes. it's quite useful. It's pretty, pretty awesome, mm -hmm. you know, to say the least. And and the, the kind of people that come up and talk to us are the kind of people that I really, I'm like, I love it because yeah. I feel like these are the people I want to help. Yeah. And they tell you great stories. We got a, we got a book the other day from somebody. I mean, he, he was open. He, his wife had committed suicide a few years oh, beforehand and he had written a book about what it's like to be a survivor. Oh, wow. You know, I think he had kids as well and all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. a survivor. And he said, watching your videos and, and gave me a passion for something yeah. and gave me like a, you know, like a, 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 and so stuff like that makes all of this stuff worthwhile. That's Cause like, amazing. So that's why we do it. So yeah, my wife had just said to me, people ask you questions all the time. Why do you turn this into something? But I don't think we really thought that there was going to be any like monetization, you know, oh, sure, it was, sure. We didn't. We didn't even put an ad on a YouTube video for eighteen months. Wow! Yeah. Even when we got to the point where you could put ads on it, it was like, yeah, but why? Because it's kind of annoying to see the ads. Mm -hmm. But then we got to a point where we were doing covers of songs, and we were doing breakdowns of songs, and mm -hmm. then people just started putting ads on everything. So we had no sure. control over it. Sure, sure. So, well, I mean, and it's obviously how long ago was it that you started it? It's crazy now. I keep I keep thinking it's not that long ago, but it's going to be 10 years soon. Wow, wow. Which is insane. That is great.
that is so awesome. And I mean, it's uh, the following that you've built and the real community, I think. that I think that, the community thing is the biggest thing. Yeah. We, we've never, even though we've got a large following, it's like 750 or 60,000 people, mm -hmm. even though we have a large following, following and big email list and blah, 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 all that yeah. kind of stuff and big social media numbers. Mm -hmm. Even we got all that stuff. <coughs> we don't get videos. We've never been viral of anything. We have a few videos that got a million plus views and hundred, high hundreds of thousands. What I say to people is when I go and watch YouTube videos by different, you know, like influencers, they tend to be very genre specific. Like we talked about at the beginning, mm -hmm. like, you know, um, one of our business partners is a wonderful guy, Christian Kohler. He has a, 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 a thing that we do together called the Kohler Audio Cult, yeah. and it's specifically at metal. Yeah. And he's amazing because he's just that he's just that right side of 40 that he's recorded on tape. And he knows digital. Mm -hmm. He knows how to make a drum kit sound amazing. And he also knows how to program drums. Right. You know, so he is like the perfect guy in that thing. And he has a really amazing following. And it's super focused and super engaged. Mm -hmm. So he'll put out a video and maybe get 15,000 views on it. We'll put out a metal video and get 15,000 views. And people are like, well, you know, why couldn't that get 300,000? It's like, because the audience, we have the metal audience. We have yes. the punk audience. We have the classical audience, the jazz audience, the classic rock audience, yeah. all in one place. And that yeah. has always been a passion of mine. So it's a little bit like, you know, when I was saying like, you know, don't try to be a jack of all trades until you get a little older. <laughs> what I'm saying is like, I like being able to yeah. speak to all of these different communities. Yeah. And then the the crazy people like us that love, you know, the Dam's first record and also can appreciate Night of the Opera and think it's amazing. And, mm -hmm. you know, Miles Davis and Coltrane and Marvin Gaye and all that stuff. Hendrix, you name it. We, we can appreciate all of that. You know, a Joni Mitchell, Hygiera or something like that. Mm -hmm. It all is the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's been a big, big passion of mine to really try to connect people together and our community is insane like yeah. our private community produced like a pro academy has an 80 20 split between uh, men and women oh, okay. and like 20 percent is not as good as it could be but, but it's, it's 17 percent better than anybody else yes <laughs> yeah no it's awesome i mean everyone that uh because we worked together on a few things the, the studio in your old house and then we did that uh um Man UCLA project. Yeah, the, that was amazing. The auditorium, um, which was really fun. But yeah, when I mentioned that I'm working with Warren, everyone knows who you are. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's That's a, nice. it's a cool thing. And nice, yeah. But we've got to try and keep it egoless though, because right <laughs> for me, because because it's like, um, I uh, like Christian. You know, came he's at Nam as well with us, and you know, he he's German, so he came in. And normally you end up doing all of the, you know, the influencer YouTube events and all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. And I was like, dude, we don't want to do that. Let's, yeah. We'll go to Vintage King. Yep. And I just missed you last night there. Oh, you the did? Yes. I, I. Someone said that you you had just walked out and we had we had come in. I think we were ships passing. In but the I night, think so. we were the only two people there that have a YouTube channel. Right. Because everybody that's there, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. We, you know, I hate the word professional because Jack always said to me, I think Jack Douglas was our second interview. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, I, I don't mind I, I don't mind being an idiot and admitting it. He said to me, why the heck did you call it produce like a pro? Yeah. I was like, oh, you know, because I didn't want to call it, no, no disrespect to Dave. I was like, I don't want to call it Warren's Place. I don't want it to be about me. Sure, sure. I want it to be about yeah. production. Yeah. And every channel was always talking about mixing. Mm -hmm. And that's still every channel just talks about mixing. And sure. I was like, well, you've got to record it first. So mm -hmm. I was like, so I wanted it to be about production and I didn't want to put my name in it. Mm -hmm. And he's like... Yeah, but Warren, I hate professionals. <laughs> That's the thing about the creative sure. arts. The professional, he said yeah. to me, the professionals are the ones that are telling you you're doing it wrong. Oh, okay. So it's kind of a good point. So. I never thought of it that way. Uh, as far as when I hear produce like a pro, I always look no, at it as but a it's, positive it's, light. it's a joke. But I, I completely relate to that because yeah. you know I didn't go to school for this. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't intern at a studio. Um, I was just like, which is one of another big reason why we started the channel was because we we thought well. I, you know, we had we had that house and that studio, and I think that was like my third or fourth studio, fourth studio in L. No, fifth studio I had in L.A. Mm -hmm. First one I had was in my house in Silver Lake, mm -hmm. uh, and then I had one at uh, at, at, at a different. Uh, rehearsal studio and then I had another one another rehearsal studio and then I had another room and then we had the one um, mm -hmm. the one that you knew of yeah. so all of those all these different studios have all grown and developed uh, but you'd walk into that studio essentially with the exception of like two or three pieces that we had got through YouTube 99.9% .9 of the gear in that room was bought and paid for by making records oh yeah you know, so I and I'd never gone to school for it I'd been in bands I'd done demos I grew up pretty dirt poor and I just thought to myself 
this is what everybody has to do now. Yeah. So let's do the channel. It's, I love it. My wife's idea is a good one because we can be like, this is yeah this this is what everybody has to do and that's what people are looking for you know and uh by the way it just clicked with me that you moved and that's why your christmas card came back to me i sent you guys a christmas card but uh i was like thank you i was like how did that how happy did that christmas come back? yes i'll have to i'll have to sorry read. america merry christmas yeah i'll have to send it to you uh, at your new address i'll get that for you yep. um man well it's really awesome like i said that you guys uh, took the time out of your busy schedule to come here and do this with us uh but and, this is what it's all about it's, yeah yeah I really appreciate it. And every time that uh, we get to, to catch up, I enjoy it immensely. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my same boring stories that I tell. What are you talking about? I didn't, I didn't, I'd never heard any of that. Oh, okay, yeah, good. We, we always talk about what we're doing at the time and like yep. the backstory is, is where it's at. So, yeah. um, but thanks again, Warren, for being here. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. Well, that's been another episode of The Sound Project. Thanks for being a part of it. And we're also recording a uh, interview for Warren's channel at Produce Like a Pro. So make sure you go check that out as well. And we'll see you next week.